My name is Andre. I came from Portugal. Who did watch the last game of Portugal with Morocco? Raise your hands. What a disaster, right? So I was flying to Tel Aviv at that time and uh, I couldn't know what would happen. And I thought I'll be just celebrating some good finals of Portuguese team in some sports bar in Tel Aviv. And now you see, I don't have any reason to go to the sports bars anymore. Um, today I will speak about the hardcore thing of the network protocols, but don't be worried. The hardcore thing will be gradual and I'll try to be more entertaining. Let's start with some story. Uh, there was a World War II. And in World War II, the communication means were different. Sometimes it were pigeons, sometimes it were dogs. But of course, the communications was mostly happening, mostly happening through some more modern radio style communications. And we all know that the communication is extremely important at the war. The war has ended and some data was collected about the engagements, the battles, and some analysts and historians started to analyze that data trying to find what is the reason for Americans winning more than half of the battles and most of the engagements. And they drove their attention to one little fact. And the fact is that in English language, the average word length is 4.7 letters, and in German, it's one-third bigger. And really, if you are calling for the fire support in English, it's quite shorter than in German. So one of the possible conclusions were that because the German language is quite longer, it was taking longer to communicate and it led to losing more battles. And this is, I think it's an anecdote more than a true story. It's hard to attribute only to the language, uh, the win of the battle, but it's, it illustrates the idea that the, the effects of your communication protocols, even the smaller effects, can build up over time and lead to some really sizable outcomes. In this talk, I'm going to mention several protocols and serialization strategies. Hopefully, you will find one that you heard of or using on a daily basis and you will learn something new. How did I learn all of this? How do, how can you learn all of this? Well, my journey was, uh, starting with performance testing where most of the focus is on the network layer. You look how network functions, you simulate the load through the network. So you learn a lot from the, uh, from that job. Then I worked with, uh, uh, Kubernetes traffic capturing and the company, uh, that produced a nice open source project called KubeShark. Check it out. Uh, it captures the traffic, so you see all of the intricacies of the network traffic and you look closely and you see that sometimes you, you could optimize it. And now I work in Commodore where we focused on troubleshooting Kubernetes and the network is a big part of the troubleshooting of Kubernetes. And through all of that time, the best thing I ever saw is it was a graph in monitoring like that. It's the graph of you change something, and the resource consumption goes drastically down. It's such a relief. It's such a good feeling when you uh, manage to find that thing. What's that thing? Usually, it's not something super fancy. Usually, it's a, some default value somewhere that you just need to change it into, into more optimal state. And what I saw also is that today people tend to ignore those network protocol level tuning and values saying, well, I don't control that. It's something out of my responsibility and out of my control. Well, it's not like that. Maybe you feel less confident because you have less experience and you are scared to break something. Um, I think it's quite easy to move to, to the other state when you actually can change whatever you want, understand the consequences, measure the consequences, and be confident that everything would be going according to the plan. I'm offering you a simple method to learn today that you can look at your network communications, be more conscious, be more educated with your choices, and maybe optimize it today or tomorrow. First step, 
let's understand the goal. The goal is optimization. You are always optimizing costs, quality of the service, time to recover from problems. And in fact, you're always optimizing one thing. It's money. It's costs. Because all of the factors, how fast the quality of responses you have, how quickly you recover, how cheap is your infrastructure, how small it is, it's all money, money, money. Next, two sides. Remember that there are two sides of communications, but now I'm talking not about the server and client. I'm talking about inside the cluster and outside the cluster. If we talk about network protocols, what happens inside the cluster differs drastically from what happens outside. Outside, there's demand for security, the service quality, the traffic quality, the, the transport quality is not so reliable. While inside the cluster, it's okay to move gigabytes of data from here to there. There's less stress on security. So it's different when you're looking at your network protocols and you're willing to optimize. Don't try to apply wrong techniques outside the cluster or inside the cluster. Next, three layers. I know there's a seven-layer OSI model of the network protocols. I respect that, but on a practical level, I tend to divide it into three layers. First layer is a transport layer. Yes, that's something that we control less, and we should aim to control it less probably in today's reality of cloud and network operations uh, delegated to somebody else. Then there is the application protocol, and that's the way... That's the place you choose when you create your next service. You choose the protocol you use. You tune the options of that protocol. And finally, the most impact you can do is actually on the business logic level. It's not the protocol itself. It's not the, um, it's not the values or defaults you are changing there. It's more of how you use it, how you organize your code. And the practices of coding affect that a lot, but the results will be on the network protocol layer. And finally, four things you usually look at quickly to understand is your protocol closer to optimal or not. First is connection opening. How do you open your connections? Do you do that frequently? Do you reuse your connections? How much does it cost you to open the connection? Second is encryption. Do you encrypt your data? Do you need to encrypt your data? I know there are folks that want to encrypt everything everywhere, including within the same machine. Uh, know your trade-offs. Know how much you pay for encrypting everything. Compress. If you can transfer less, do transfer less. If you can compress by the cost of CPU, probably you should do it. If it costs you too much to compress or it's already compressed and repeating doesn't make sense, don't do that. And serialization. The way you transform the data along the way actually can be really impactful. And sometimes it's not impactful, contrary to, to your intuition. We'll, we'll see the details of that today. Now, let's walk over some popular protocols that we all use to use and using still to learn uh, some examples of that method. It starts with HTTP 1.1. We all know that it's a main workhorse of the internet back to 1997. The spec originates from there and we still use it on a daily basis. It's very simple and plain text. It's easy to understand it. And the flow is very, very primitive. Open the transport layer connection, shove in your request, read your response. You are done. You can close the connection if you want. If, if we look one level deeper, uh, HTTP is super obvious. There is some metadata first line of status or request, key value pairs of request and response, the payloads of bodies that are optional. That's how it looks inside. And first step to look at optimizing it is how we open the connections. For the sake of this presentation, I made a very simple measurement. We all we all should measure the optimizations that we do. And the simple setup was the Nginx web server and the load testing tool hitting that Nginx web server and measuring the outcomes. And what I noticed on this graph, bigger is slower, bigger is bigger CPU consumption, bigger is worse. 
what I notice is that it's two times slower if you reopen the connection each time you send the request. And luckily, HTTP 1.1 by default keeps connections alive. But if in your code, you are killing the object of the client, it would sh shut down the connection still. So it's obvious that you are spending more CPU and uh, more time to reopen the connections. But what if you are operating on a global scale and you need to encrypt it? The difference be be becomes enormous. The difference of adding SSL is huge. It's more than 100 times slower, and it takes 20 times more CPU to reopen connections with PLS. So that all leads us to an obvious conclusion. Just reuse your TCP connections. If you open that, use the connection pool, put it there, reuse it when needed, but don't reopen it every time. I understand that it's easier to develop the Go routine that would be just launching and dying and it's so easy and it's stateless, but this is what you pay sometimes 100 times more to reopen that. Next thing, let's talk about the compression. Uh, I did the same simple experiment with the same setup. I enabled the compression of responses. And what I found is that I'm only saving 20 person bytes less and I'm spending 40% more CPU. Initially, I was puzzled because I was looking for those like three times, four times savings of the traffic. But then I quickly found one, I would call it, uh, it's not a trap, but it's not obvious fact that HTTP 1.1 only standardizes the compression of response body. And if you would open your developer, developer tools today and you would look how many Headers do you transfer? Sometimes it's more headers than bodies are transferred because of all cookies and tracking, all of that. So this is another problem of HTTP 1.1. If you use that, is the lack of compression of other parts. Now, the biggest problem of HTTP 1.1 that were known is when you start doing something in parallel. It's okay when you open the connection and it all goes well, but what if you want to have Two parallel connections. You know so many resources, JavaScripts and CSS to transfer. All right, it works. What if we want more? Great. What if we want more? Well, suddenly something happens. In your browser, there is a limit of six connections. I really tried to find why. Why six? Why not eight? Why not 50? I didn't find any good explanation, but the, the limit is there. I understand that it's because of the overhead, because the browser uh, developers, they don't want to explode in out of memory because you are trying to download hundreds of resources at the same time, and it all causes so much overhead. So because of this problem, the HTTP version 2 was brought up, and people tried to address the known problems of HTTP 1.1. They introduced the header compression, really sophisticated HPAC algorithm that compresses and really saved, uh, saves uh, data for the transfer of headers. The connections, the problem of multiple connections became the multiplex connection, and I will explain what that means. And they also built in some requirements for TLS to be more secure and the built-in web WebSocket um, support for the technology. What does it mean to multiplex the connections? The connection multiplexing is a very simple thing. Let's open just single TCP transport connection and let's just put all the packets we want to transfer through that single pipe. We still have single wire to transfer, so it doesn't matter. Just use one TCP connection for that. And it feels great. There's less overhead. There is less uh, resource consumption on both client and server, and you're using your TCP connection more efficiently. But then the next happen, the next problem result from that functioning, and it's the fact that TCP by design has a congestion control algorithm, which is called slow start. It's very conservative. It says, let's send one packet first. Let's get acknowledgement for that packet, and then let's maybe send two packets. And then if we are optimistic that it goes well, let's increase the volumes of data that we are transferring. 
And that's first problem. And it's by the standard you cannot do much with it. And the t- when you put all of that communication into the same single pipe of multiplexed connection, well, TCP requires uh, each packet to arrive in a sequence and to guarantee the delivery. So if one packet in the middle gets lost, the whole line of other packets belonging maybe to other resources that are innocent in this situation, they will all need to wait for connection to be negotiating the packet loss and restoring the the normal function. And all of that led to the third generation of the HTTP protocol when they said, okay, the HTTP part is great, all of that uh, header compression, we all love it. But now we need to change the bottom part of it, of the transport layer. And the TCP is not good. Let's use UDP. Guys from Google are really creative. They uh, brought up the quick algorithm. It's the algorithm to replace TCP delivery guarantees with TLS included. All of that. And it's not HTTP. Uh, it's not TCP anymore. So head of line blocking. Uh, slow start is not a problem anymore. It has its own features of controlling the communications. It's great. The browsers and the applications using browsers are amazed. I think it's really great achievement for the protocol side of HTTP and web development to get that far with solving all of the problems and dare to even change the transport layer into UDP. But there's one interesting conclusion I want to share with you. So if we look at that HTTP 1, 2, and 3 evolution and features, it's great progress for the browsers. But at the same time, the communications today is not... We're usually not dealing with that on a daily basis. Why? Because we all sit behind the edge routers, CDNs, cloud providers. We're not affecting that directly anymore. And it's great that the cloud providers and CDNs are using HTTP 2 and hopefully they will adopt HTTP 3. But do we really care? We develop microservices inside the cluster. Remember that two sides of things to look at. So inside the cluster, all of that uh, connection unreliable problem or transfer volume problem, it's less intense. And do we want to... Uh, complicate our web development by using different techniques of HTTP 2 and 3, or just we keep dragging HTTP 1.1 with us? That's a question I want you to think of. Maybe you don't need HTTP 2 and 3, although I like them, but maybe the future like looks like the past, and nothing will change in 20 years from now. HTTP 1.1 is still sufficient. Come to, come to the Commodore booth, discuss that question with me, share your opinion on that question with me. Now, we learned about HTTP and TCP-based connection opening. Now we can, with that knowledge, move to some other protocols. Some of them uh, inherit from HTTP some of their functions, but I still think it's worth mentioning because you use that on your daily basis. And... First of them is GraphQL. GraphQL is not a protocol. It's more of a query language, but it's so widely used that you can think of it as a protocol on top of HTTP transport. And since it's on top of HTTP transport, it inherits all of the compression, connection reopening things and recommendation from there. And this is specifically for GraphQL because the request part of it is so big. It's not just simple get. Usually you interact with quite sizable uh, requests. Remember that HTTP does not compress requests by default. Maybe you should take time and introduce your own compression to save the transfer volumes of this data. The next thing, oh, by the way, GraphQL, the responses. Ask your developers to transfer less. Uh, Something really Worrying happens with GraphQL. It, it stimulates the worst qualities of the human, maybe some infernal qualities of human. And, and human starts to, to just transfer everything through GraphQL 
all the database, all the volume. So ask your developers to limit that uh, volume. It would really, really affect your systems in a good way because I understand it's easy to just don't think of it and just transfer everything uh, in responses. Now, the gRPC, you probably heard of it and you probably heard that it's some magical binary protocol that it's so great that everyone should migrate off REST into gRPC and you will get instant benefits. Later, I will show you some measurements around that. And now let's just understand what gRPC is. gRPC is very simple. It's the serialization algorithm of protobufs plus generated code that would transfer that serialized state through HTTP2 transport. They used HTTP2, great. So it's already encapsulated for you. And in fact, it all boils down to that protobuf serialization. So it's the practice of coding in RPC style when you just uh, use the generated code and it looks for you as calling the function as opposed to working with HTTP client. And alternatives that exist to gRPC is Apache Thrift and Avro encodings. Some people argue those are not the same. I say the idea behind them and the algorithm are mostly the same. It's, it's all about your practices of coding. Which style of coding the network interactions do you prefer? On the network layer, it will be roughly the same kind of serializations. Um, finally, the message queue protocols. We cannot uh, skip the message queue protocols because they are widely used. And in many applications, you would have to use this great pattern of pub sub uh, or uh, consumer producer. Let's see what we can do with the network protocols of message queues. Most of the message queue protocols are binary and they use TCP as a transport with all of the implications of reopening connections, TLS costs, all of that applies here. Uh, some of them, although, are straight HTTP like Amazon SQS. It, it does not use hardcore binary protocol. It uses HTTP protocol. We, also, we already know how to deal with that, how to tune and observe what, what's there. Uh, one main thing with all of the message queues is that compression is on you. Since they are binary, they don't offer you any compression features built in. They Im imply that you will be compressing your data. So if you're shoving in huge JSON into your Kafka messages queue, uh, make sure that you're probably shrinking it before doing so. Otherwise, you'll get a lot of traffic without good reason. To mention specific protocols, I would say most of the market is held by MQP and MQTT protocols. And those are protocols, not programs. So there is, for example, ActiveMQ by Apache, RabbitMQ using MQP, some MQTT vendors, uh, Internet of Things, you know, they use this style of protocols. They don't offer almost anything to tune on the protocol level. So you're just choosing the protocol. TLS, not TLS, and that's it. That's what you can control. This is why I was telling you about the three-layer story. If you can't do anything on the transport layer or application level proto uh, application protocol layer, think what, what you can do to affect your communications in a good way on the business logic level. For example, if we will talk about Apache Kafka protocol, it's again not much to tune on the protocol layer itself, but because it uses acknowledgements and uh, commit actions uh, on the topics, they offer you to use message batching on your application layer, group the messages into bunches, and commit, move them by these bigger bunches. This way you will reduce the overhead, and in the message queue you will still affect the communication and op optimize the performance of it. And then when, you when we talk about Kafka, Usually we mention things like JSON or Protobuf or Avro. What should we do? Let's now switch from protocols to the separate thing that is not a protocol but tightly connected. And it's the data serialization strategies. Uh, a lot of holy wars happening there and I like to participate in those. Again, come to the booth, discuss with me uh, 
your observations of that. In this situation, again, I just did some measurements because I love doing measurements. And this is what I found. These graphs now will be the higher, the better. So this is the speed of encoding. First thing that I found is that encoding and decoding does not produce the same speed. So Golang, I took the great Golang language and I started to encoding and decoding JSONs of different contents. And I've, what I see consistently is that with any type of data in Golang, it's twice slower to decode it than to encode it. This is what you should think about it. There are applications like Internet of Things which only encode data and never decode it. There are server sites that only decode data and never encode it. You should think about your trade-offs here. Why? Because there's another aspect to it. And this is the languages and technologies. Golang is slightly slower than Node.js. That was my surprise when I measured it. Node.js is faster to encode and decode than Golang when it comes to JSON. Python, surprisingly faster to decode the JSON. And Java is, with all my love, just a loser. Uh, can you see? Certain love can happen between the client side generating on Node.js JSONs and pushing it for Python to decode. What an interesting observation was for me. Now, let's do the comparison of JSON versus protobuf. It's very interesting to do these kind of compressions because, uh, um, comparisons because it's like gRPC should be better than HTTP REST, right? That's the intuition. Well, I measured it. And when it comes to the strings data, JSON is faster. Just by an edge, but it's faster than involving all of the complications of protobuf encoding. If the data is mixed like a regular REST style communication, the difference is around 20%. Again, it's a big question. Do you want to disrupt all your code base migrating to gRPC because of that benefit? As a lot of times it's not. And the numbers, when it's mostly numbers, the screen doesn't fit it. So this is that much of a difference. So here you go. This is when the protobuf and gRPC would shine. If your data is mostly numbers, then the JSONs will be slow and protobuf will be really fast. So huge volumes of numeric data, binary data would give you substantial benefits to use um, gRPC or maybe use protobuf encoded payloads over HTTP even because that's most of the time that it spends. When I was preparing this, I did many, many other measurements. There are more facts to share interesting things, but I have limited time. So let's summarize what we learned today. And I turned that into a quick checklist because I want all of you to remember it and use that on practice. We have two sides of communication, two different areas of communication. It's inside the cluster and outside the cluster. Treat them differently. Choose the protocols and options differently for inside the cluster and outside the cluster. And outside the cluster, you know, HTTP 3 is the future. HTTP 2 is a must today. HTTP 1.1, Still acceptable, probably. Second, you have three layers to look at your situation with protocols. Understand what you control, understand what you can move, and what you cannot change so it stays on the same level. And look at four top aspects, four top things to tune. Connection reuse, that's the most of the impact that you can do. Compress the traffic. Do you need the encryption? Maybe not. And serialization. And always remember, don't do any preliminary optimizations. Only change something when you need to change it. Don't waste your time optimizing what doesn't need to optimize. Thank you very much. 
I hope this was educative. We have a booth in Commodore. I'm doing open source things in Commodore. Network protocols is not my primary thing. So come and talk. Let's share experiences around networks. Uh, we have some other cool things like swag, happy hour, come and see us. Thank you very much.